2020. Not talking about perfect vision, but about the year that is now drawing to a close. Think about the year as, as we began the year. Uh, none of us certainly could have foreseen the events that would have that would unfold during the year. Probably many of us had had very high expectations for this year. If you're a sports fan, you know that it was supposed to be an Olympic year. Of course, those plans were canceled. It was an election year, and those plans still went forward, but not without some hitches along the way. It was also a year for some people to graduate, for some people to get married, and many of those plans had to be delayed or drastically altered from the original plans. So many things were disrupted. So many things canceled. So many things were not what we wanted, not what we expected. There may have been much disappointment, perhaps much sadness and heartache and loss. And with only six days left in this year, we may very well look back on this past year and think, that's it? That's it, God? Think about all the, the hype that was leading up to the first Christmas. We talked about uh, that last evening in our worship together. But literally thousands of years of prophetic markings of God's promises that he had made to his people and repeated to his people God's people were, were looking forward with longing and with eager expectation to, to finally be able to unwrap that gift that God had prepared for them. Think about the, the expectation that maybe as a child you had or, or maybe as a parent you observed in your children, that, that expectation of, of waiting or finally either Christmas Eve night or Christmas Day morning to come around when he could finally tear off the wrapping paper and see what marvelous thing was hidden underneath. God's people couldn't wait to, to finally see all of the full details of God's fulfilled promise of the Savior be revealed. In our worship service yesterday, we, we heard about some of those things that God had promised that the Savior would do, that he would crush the devil's head, break the power of the devil over us, over all people on the, on the world. That he would, he would restore the perfect harmony that God had originally created the world and that he intended the world and, and everything in the world, especially the crown of his creation, people to have with him. We read about the, the, the wonderful eternal kingdom of God where Wild, ravenous animals as we know them today will live in peace with, with the calm and the meek animals like sheep and goats and even with little children will put their hands in, into to poisonous snakes' nests and, and will not be harmed. A little child will lead all of those wild and ravenous animals because in God's perfect eternal kingdom there will be no strife, no conflict, no suffering or pain. Or death. We heard about how all the ends of the earth will see the glory of God's salvation. They will know and rejoice in the blessings that God gives to us through his promised great gift, the Savior. And so as we think about that, we think about that idea of, of hype and of, of expectation, of waiting to see and, and to tear open the wrapping on a gift and to find out what it is, we realize that Jesus was perhaps the most hyped person in the history of the world. But then you think about the actual circumstances of God finally delivering that gift to his people after those many hundreds and thousands of years of waiting and, and wondering and, and expectation. And if you had, had had known all that hype, and then you had gone and seen with your own eyes the, the circumstances of how that gift was given, maybe you would have been wondering, well, really? Is this it, God? 
Is this the, the greatest gift that you promised there in a, in a feeding trough for animals? Uh, born to, to simple, common uh, parents? Not anyone very special in, in the society of that day? Without a, a, a fancy... A retinue of, of honor guards and heralds going before him, but, but simple, common shepherds coming to, to worship him at his birth. Really? That's it, God? That is your gift to us? Well, sadly, we may find ourselves disappointed with God's Christmas gift to us. Think about the fact that Many times we, we pray for God to, to help us in some way. We desperately need his assistance with some trouble that we're facing. But God doesn't always do what we want, at least not right away when we ask for it. And, and sometimes he, he never does exactly what we're asking for. We want to get accepted to that college, or we want to marry that person. We want to to get that job that we applied for, that dream job, or perhaps a promotion or a raise. But our expectations aren't always met in the way we would like them to be. And especially in a year like this, uh, when so many people have, have gotten sick or, or are suffering as a result of the, the economic fallout of, of everything that's going on, you might look around at, at all that hardship and suffering, perhaps that, that, that we experience in our own lives or our loved ones are experiencing, and we think, really? That's it, God? You can't do anything more about this, about all of these terrible and tragic circumstances of hardship and great difficulty for so many people, perhaps in my own life or the lives of my loved ones? That's it? That's the best you can do? Why do we, we become so disappointed? Maybe it's because we don't always really fully grasp everything that, that God has revealed to us about what the, the true essence of this gift is that he has promised to give to us. About what he promised that Jesus has done for us and, and is doing for us and will do for us in the future. So on this Christmas Day, let's look again at the manger, at, at the, the circumstances, the reality of God's gift to us. And we'll look at that through the lens of, of our sermon text for this morning, Romans chapter 8, verse 32. It's not a very common verse that we read at Christmas time, but it's a verse that really helps us truly to ponder the, the true meaning, the true essence of this greatest gift from God to us. And it also helps us, helps us to think about the giver of this gift, our Heavenly Father. Think about it if you have a Christmas tree at home, if you, if you have or had wrapped presents under the Christmas tree. You look at those presents. Uh, do you simply see that, that them as, as the object that they are, just, just a wrapped gift, uh, nothing more than that? Or, or do you see the love, the care behind that gift that, that someone took to prepare and to give that gift to you. Often more than just the, the simple fact of the gift itself, what that gift is, is what we see behind the gift, that love of, of, of someone who has given the gift for us. Maybe think especially about, uh, about handmade or homemade gifts, maybe that, that children make to give to, to parents or, or other relatives or friends. That gift that, that shows that they, they put time and effort into to creating something themselves. Not just, or perhaps it, if, if you as, as an adult also make a, a homemade gift. The time that it took, the, the labor and the care and, and the attention to detail to prepare that gift that you crafted for someone else. Or maybe it, it is spending money. Sometimes people spend a lot of money on a gift. Because if it's someone that they love and care about, money is, is no object. They just simply want to show their love and, and to bring joy into another person's life. And they, they, they're not worried about the cost. 
Now think about that gift that God gave to you, to all of us in the manger. Not just a, a, a simple baby there in the manger. He was giving you his own son. More than that, he was giving up his son. Giving up his son to death for you. As our verse reads, Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son, who did not spare the life of his own son, but gave him up for us all. Gave him up to death for us all. Think about that. That baby in the manger was God's son from all eternity. Think of everything that, that God, the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit experienced together all of the events of, of the history of, of our world as we know it, and so many other things that we don't even know about that only God knows. There, God's work, the, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of creating the world together by God's own powerful word out of nothing, creating the whole universe it's in all its vast array and detail, all the, the living beings on the earth. With, with all the detail and, and marvelous perfection of our bodies. Think about all the, the events in, in which God interacted with his people throughout the history of the world. God delivering his people through the, the great flood of Noah's time. God coming to Abraham and choosing him to be the father of God's chosen people, the people of Israel, and giving to Abraham the promise that the Savior would come from his descendants. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, working together to rescue God's people from slavery in Egypt. Together, receiving the, the glory of psalm writers like David, and those who sang those psalms of praise to God in the temple that Solomon built and dedicated for God in Jerusalem for God's worship. With all of those shared experiences, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, imagine how close the Father and Son were from all eternity, that close and loving personal relationship. And yet, the Father was willing to give up his own Son for sinners like you and me. Those of you who are our parents or who have dear nieces and nephews, think about the love that you have for your children or for your nieces and nephews. Think about the fact that, that if you were called upon in a, in a critical situation, you would do just about anything you could, even sacrificing your own life to keep them safe. Now, could you imagine giving up your child in order to save someone who had would sin against you again and again, who, who had hurt and, and harmed you and, and scorned and mocked you in so many ways, who had betrayed you and stabbed you in the back, not just once, but, but every day? Inconceivable. You would never, ever give up your own child for someone as despicable as that. That is how much God so much that he willingly gave up his own son, his only son, to death on the cross to save us. Even though we have sinned and, and sin against him every day. But think about our daily lives. What, what does the baby in the manger born at Christmas say about what God thinks about me as I face the the real troubles, difficulties, and disappointments of my everyday life. Well, in our worship service yesterday evening, we read from the Old Testament about how God promised to send the Savior as soon as that first act of rebellion against him occurred in the Garden of Eden. Right away, out of his great mercy for the crown of his creation, the people that he had created, God immediately gave them hope. Gave them the promise that a Savior would come, would crush the devil's head, would free them 
from sin. Restore their harmonious relationship with God. Then for thousands of years after that, literally thousands of years, God watched as, as a world full of the people that he had created to have a loving, harmonious relationship with himself constantly disobeyed him, turned their backs on him. God could have said, forget it. I'm not going to send my son as I had promised before. You're, you ruined everything. I've changed my mind. I love my son way too much to let him live among people who will scorn and, and ridicule and abuse and mistreat and, and kill him. God could have said that. He would have had every right. He would have been perfectly justified to say that. But 2,000 years ago, God kept his promises as he wrapped up his son, the, the greatest gift he has given to humankind. He gave him there in the manger in Bethlehem as a gift for the whole world. Now think about what our reading today, Romans 8.32, calls us to ponder. If God has followed through on that promise, doesn't that give you confidence that God will keep all of his other promises to you as well? Because of this greatest gift that God has given to us at Christmas, the gift of his own son to be our Savior. You can be sure that God will keep all of the other promises that he has made to you in his word. You can be confident that God will do it when he promises that he will send his angels to guard you in all of your ways. That those mighty spiritual beings are always watching over us at God's command fighting against the spiritual forces of evil in, in the unseen realm, fighting to help us stay strong in the face of temptation, to stay strong in faith in Jesus as our Savior. Because of Christmas, because God has fulfilled this greatest promise, giving us the greatest gift of his own Son, we can be confident in his promise that he is always with us, that he will never leave us or forsake us because of Christmas, because of this greatest gift that God has given to us. We can be confident that he will keep his promise to work all things, all things, for your good. Even things that are very difficult and painful and tragic. God will work in all of those events to draw you closer to himself to strengthen your faith in him and in Jesus as your Savior until he brings you to his side for eternal life in heaven. And be confident in God's promise that absolutely nothing will be able to separate you from his love through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. That nothing can snatch you out of his almighty hand where he holds and protects you and cares for you. Be assured that because God has given you the greatest gift of his Son, as our verse states, how will he not also graciously give us all things along with him? He will indeed. Today we realize that these aren't just empty words to make us feel better. God is faithful, perfectly faithful to all of his promises. And the manger proves it. The greatest gift of God's own Son proves his faithfulness to every one of his promises. So look at the manger. Remember the gift that God has given, not just during this Christmas season, but all the time. Remember this greatest gift that God has given to us. And again, as we, as we look at that gift, as we look at that scene of, of, of the manger and, and that, that simple couple in lowly circumstances giving birth to an ordinary looking baby and that all outward appearances that, that gift looks small and insignificant it looks, looks fragile and frail and helpless the circumstances might be dirty and, and smelly and, and perhaps a bit disappointing 
to what we might expect and hope to see for such a glorious and wonderful gift. And after what we have heard today and yesterday evening from God's Word, we can look at that gift and say, not that's it. We can say, that's it. That is the gift that we really needed. That is just what I need. That is God showing his unconditional love to me. That is God keeping his promises for me. That is is quite a gift, the greatest gift. It's just the gift that I need. May the good news of this greatest gift of all time, of our Savior Jesus, fill you with joy and peace and hope not only at at this Christmas time, but all the time. May God give you many opportunities in the coming days and, and weeks and months to share this joy and peace and hope that comes from knowing this greatest gift of God's Son, Jesus, our Savior. May God give you opportunities to share this good news with many other people so that they also can have that same hope that we have all because of God's gift of his Son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen.